Welcome. Welcome back, colleagues. So we're back with Seeks Learn, the Local Energy Resources Network. This is our 20th meeting, and uh, we missed last month. So a lot of you we got to see at the Seek Forum, which was super great. It was nice to see you all in person, and um, also lovely that we get to stay in touch virtually this way every month with Learn. So um, today, in the heart of summer, I am featuring a background. It's actually it's a kayak ride in the beautiful Channel Islands off of the coast of Ventura and Santa Barbara. So in the chat, would you mind just introducing yourself and what part of the beautiful state of California you are um, hailing from today? And if you're comfortable, you can always turn on your webcam. We like that. And I'll go ahead and introduce myself. We'll go to the next slide. I'm Angie Hacker. I'm the statewide best practices coordinator for SEEK, joined today by a couple of other members of the SEEK team. We've got Kelsey and Tila who are around and they'll say hi over chat. They can always help you if you need it. Um, so as always, these one hour meetings are designed to provide a space for local governments and those that work with them to dive in on programs and opportunities that can advance your climate and energy goals. We are we know you're super busy. We heard all about all the really cool things you're doing at the forum. So we want to make sure you have all the time you can to work on those really awesome initiatives and not have to do all of the scanning, searching, and perusing for opportunities, which is what we like to bring to you at these meetings. So you come here and you get briefed. Today, um, we're going to go through a round table of opportunities like we always do. And we are very happy to be Joined today by Ina Lupin. She is with the um, Strategic Growth Council, and she's going to talk to us today about the second round of the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program. So excited to hear about that. Uh, a pretty high dollar, high impact program that a lot of you would be eligible to apply for. Um, we'll do a little BPC workshop at the end. And like we did in May, we have this optional breakout, a uh, bonus breakout. So at noon, you can go if you'd like, but you can stick around for an extra 15 minutes, a little bit of informal time for us to chat. And if you have a topic that you really want folks to talk with you about, you can suggest it there. We can set up separate breakouts, but in general, this will give us a chance to connect with each other. You can share announcements, best practices, needs for information. Um, so we're still testing it out, but please join us for that if you can. Okay, so let's go through the opportunity round table. There's a, oh my gosh, you guys, I don't know if it's just because a whole month went by or, you know, two months have gone by. There's so much, um, so much live right now. So many opportunities that are live. Um, a lot of new stuff that wasn't on here back in May that I wanted to share with you. Um, so this slide deck as usual is like a hyperlinked cheat sheet, not super beautiful. Um, one of the things I wanted to remind you of is that we have this need have board. That's the thing on the in the red the little button. Um, Tila's gonna throw that in the chat. And I wanted you to make sure you have access to it and use it if you need it. It's an informal way to flag interest and partnership between jurisdictions, partner organizations and service providers. So as we go through all these opportunities, you might think, I need a grant writer. I need a partner for this application. We have this RFI out, we're looking for service providers. I have a site for a pilot project. I need expertise in whatever. So that's the kind of thing you can throw in the need have board if you have something or just go peruse and see if there's somebody who might need what you have. All right, so we're gonna go through some, some of the opportunities that are live. We're not gonna, we don't have time to go through all of them, um, but we're just gonna go in order of due date. Um, I guess it's kind of nice that after the forum where we talked so much about collaboration and sort of doing emission reductions with resilience, benefiting disadvantaged communities. So those are the things that we're really seeing as themes and focus areas in a lot of these funding opportunities that are out. Um, one thing I really wanna highlight here, it's kind of an urgent one, is the EECBG formula grant. We've been talking about this one for a long time, but the Department of Energy actually reached out to me because you know we've kind of built this nice communication line with them. And they let me know that almost 250 local governments in California have not claimed their formula grant yet. So I've been kind of spreading the word where I can to try to encourage folks that are tied in with those communities um, to submit 
a very easy first step. All you got to do by July 31st is to submit a pre-award info sheet. And it's just, um, it's a few pages. It's mostly financial and administrative. So you can like send it off to your financial manager, get it in and that holds your allocation. Um, and your allocations might be $100,000. There's a whole link where you can see if you're eligible and what your allocation is. Um, and I just wanna encourage you to just keep it, keep it live. Um, there's more work to be done after the pre-award info sheet, but it's not horrible. The application for this one isn't horrible. Um, there's something called an energy efficiency conservation strategy you'd have to submit, but you have a long time to do that. Um, and there's also a lot of help with the EECBG. So uh, DOE itself provides project blueprints. You can kind of just cut and paste a proposal out of the blueprints that are already eligible for this money. Lots of technical assistance. The other thing I wanted to mention that I was looking into this a little bit more, they actually incur I don't know if you remember they were here last year. They asked us our opinion on this grant and we said, we would love to be able to form coalitions. Um, and so we, they have, they've added that in here. If you're an eligible entity, um, you can team up with others that are also eligible, pull your funds and activities. And so what only one lead agency has to apply, administer and report on the awards for multiple jurisdictions. So that could eliminate a whole big barrier. If that's what's keeping you from sending a, uh, your pre-award info sheet in, like maybe just do it and see if you could team up. I'm sure there's folks out there that would be interested in leveraging you know, your dollars with theirs and providing more value to um, a broader region. So I would actually say too, that's a good thing to throw in the need or have board if you're looking for partners on EECBG, um, that's something you can include on that board. Okay, so another one I wanna highlight here, it's brand new. Um, NOAA's got a climate resilience regional challenge. Um, the focus of this, so it's a federal program. The focus of the grant program is on collaborative approaches to achieving resilience in coastal regions. California as a coastal state is eligible and, um, and municipalities are eligible. So proposed projects should address risk reduction, regional collaboration, equity, um, build enduring capacity for adaptation. This, honestly, if you're somebody who's tracking this regional climate collaboratives out of the Strategic Growth Council, this might be another place to, you know, leverage all that time and effort and see if you can go after this grant as well. Um, it's similarly um, structured. So track one awards up to $2 million for regional collaborative building and strategy development. So I think you could do a vulnerability assessment, but there's a lot of other things you can do. Um, track two awards up to 75 million for implementation of resilience and adaptation actions. But yeah, folks that wanna be building these regional climate collaboratives, this is another pot of dollars to look into. Um, and I think, I don't know, maybe Ina can comment in on it later when she speaks, if this is something that can work alongside of the RCC, which she'll talk about. But letters of intent would be due August 21st. So you don't have a ton of time there, but just the letters of intent are due then. Um, uh, so similarly, there's a lot of these kinds of programs kind of out right now. OPR has their regional resilience planning and implementation applications. That went live in June. Um, so that one, we've been kind of talking about that one for a while too. Um, the first step in applying for that one is to fill out an intent to apply survey. Um, you can also, that survey allows you to ask for help. So there's lots of technical assistance available. The complete application is due August 29th. So, um, you know, lots of stuff in summer to apply for, uh, to work your vacations around. Um, also wanted to mention that uh, the EPA has launched this other program we've been talking about, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, they're calling it sort of the nickname is Solar for All. There's $7 billion for this program. It's obviously federal. So they are going to award up to 60 grants to states, territories, tribes, municipalities, and eligible nonprofits. Uh, she tells you what they're about, you know? Oh, somebody might need to meet. All right. Um, so, but you heard municipalities and eligible nonprofits in there. That's a lot of you all. And the idea is to create and expand low income solar programs that provide financing and technical assistance, such as workforce development, 
um, to enable low income and disadvantaged communities to deploy and benefit from residential solar. So the, what they're trying to do here is enable low income households to access affordable, resilient and clean solar energy. Their awards are big. These awards are gonna range from 25 to $400 million. So we're not talking about a small program. Um, and you know, this is really nice for a lot of you potentially out there doing energy efficiency with ratepayer dollars where you can't actually do solar work. Um, this might be a way to uh, add in those kinds of services where they're really needed alongside efficiency. Um, and so if you are a municipality or eligible nonprofit, the intent to apply is due August 14th. That's fast. I don't know. Two, some of these are too fast, but at least it's just the intent to apply. The full applications aren't due till September 26th. Again, coalitions are eligible. So they really like, you know, what we wanted was let's let um, jurisdictions work together. Now it's encouraged. Uh, I am actually reaching out to folks at the California Energy Commission to find out what they're up to and if there's an opportunity to collaborate as a state. So TBD on that one. Um, so let me see. You know, those are the ones I, wanna, I wanted to briefly highlight. Um, and then under input, just to mention that I want to say thank you to those that joined me on uh, at the pre-forum meeting we had on improving state and local coordination that was on June 13th live and in person at the forum it's such a good conversation we have worked on compiling all of that input and discussion notes that we collected and making sense of it working with our state partners on what next steps will be um, there will be a next meeting if you so like 80 people registered to attend that first one that was so great um, overwhelming interest in continuing the conversation on how we better collaborate and coordinate with our state agencies. So when we are ready to send out um, an invitation for a next meeting, you all will be uh, you all will be alerted to that and invited. Um, oh, I'm sorry, at least the local government representatives will be. Um, okay, let's go to the opportunity spotlight. So there's one opportunity I just thought, let me dive in a little bit further on. So that'll be the next slide. So it's the, uh, it's from the California Energy Commission. You know, there's all these, um, you know, these more strategy kind of funding opportunities. I wanted to highlight one, like a hard infrastructure one. This one comes out of the EPIC program, electric program investment charge. Um, it was just recently released. It's on long duration energy storage. And so, you know, what the solicita solicitation talks about is that most of the energy storage deployed in California is lithium ion technology, uh, which is useful for a shorter duration, but economically prohibitive at longer duration. So this um, opportunity is trying to demonstrate and deploy um, long duration energy storage technologies. Um, and to accelerate commercialization, commercialization of these technologies, and at the same time, improve reliability and resilience, specifically in disadvantaged communities, low-income communities, and tribes. So a lot of you serve those kinds of communities. On the right there, um, it isn't required, but they do like to see consideration um, specifically for projects that are going to serve fire, high fire risk area, PSPS areas, as well as the DAC communities. The awards are pretty big, uh, four to nine million dollars here. Actually, I gotta increase my screen so I can see it. Uh, yeah, four to nine million dollars, and you know, there's a match here. There's some other requirements, like it has to de the demonstration site has to be in an IOU service territory. Um, and the nice thing, though, the one that I, why I really brought this to your attention is because there's a focus here too on serving critical facilities, and I know a lot of you are dealing with extreme climate events, PSPS events, power outages, you're looking for opportunities to provide some resilience, you might be a really good site owner, um, or you might be a really good partner for a technology um, provider. And so here's another opportunity. If you wanna throw something in the need have board, you can if you're looking for partners. The application for this one is September 7th, um, but prospective applicants, um, in the solicitation are encouraged to actually register on the CEC's Empower Innovation website as a way to look for partners. So there's an official way 
to try to find partners. Maybe you are a site owner, but you're looking for a project developer, or maybe you're a technology developer, but you're looking for a site. Um, I'm just bringing this one to your attention because I think it's a really, it's a nice opportunity to do something really tangible in your community to build resilience. Okay. Let's see, so folks are totally encouraged in the chat to continue to provide um, announcements of their own. If there's anything I miss, you guys can help crowdsource opportunities that we may not have talked about. We would love that. And we could talk more about it in the bonus breakout later on. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce our featured speaker today. Um, she, Ina Lupin, she is here to present on the Regional Climate Collaborative. She is the program manager for Strategic Growth Council's Community Assistance for Climate Equity Program, uh, which provides technical assistance and capacity building to help California's most under-resourced communities advance cross-sectoral climate action. So Ina, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, please ask questions in the chat and we'll bring those to Ina when she's done with her overview. Great. Thank you so much, Angie. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to share about RCC. Um, I also wanted to take an opportunity to share a little bit also just about the Strategic Growth Council more broadly as well. And so we can go to the next slide here. Um, so I will be yeah, talking a little bit about SGC and the work that we do under the Community Assistance for Climate Equity Program, which is very much focused on capacity building and technical assistance. We'll dive into the details on the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program. Again, definitely welcome questions from you all as I walk through. Um, and we also will be having workshops as well. So we'll be providing a lot more detail in those workshops also. Um, I'll walk through some of the application details and technical assistance, and then I also have a couple of examples of some grantees that I'll walk through as well, just to give you a flavor for what an RCC might look like. So with that, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I think it's sometimes helpful to give a little bit of background about the Strategic Growth Council for folks who aren't aware of it, since we are kind of a, a funny organization within state government. Um, we are under the governor's office and um, we are tasked with coordinating state efforts around really complex issues like climate change, equity, public health. Um, our council is made up of seven state agency secretaries, and three public members that you'll see here. We can go to the next slide. Um, and we really focus on you know, this broader vision of supporting California communities in meeting these goals around creating healthy, thriving, and resilient communities for all. Um, we also um, you know, work very collaboratively with a variety of different partners on the state and local level to, to kind of achieve these goals. Um, so we can go to the next slide. This is essentially the portfolio of all of the things that SGC focuses on. I think many of you may have heard of our investment programs, which Angie mentioned a little bit in the introduction as well. Um, you know, many of you have probably heard of the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, Transformative Climate Communities Program, um, and others. Um, but we also do a lot of work around collaborative policy initiatives, integrated policy and planning at the state level. Um, and then we have this bucket of work that really focuses on helping to build capacity um, in communities to be doing climate related work. Um, and so that's sort of the portfolio that I focus on and that I'll be talking about today. We can go to the next slide. Um, so my team leads this Community Assistance for Climate Equity Program, which includes these four main programs um, that are really tailored to different audiences. So um, I'll be talking mostly about the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program today, and I'll provide a little bit of information about Boost just for those who may be interested. Um, but essentially, this is a suite of programs that aim to offer funding, trainings, technical assistance, and knowledge exchanges, um, really focusing specifically on underinvestment, underinvested and under-resourced communities. 
um, and really helping communities build those tools and that knowledge that's needed in order to lead their own climate equity and public health solutions. So um, the BOOST program is a capacity building program for under-resourced local governments. The Partners Advancing Climate Equity cohort is a leadership development program designed for community leaders working on climate related issues. Um, the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program, which I'll be talking about today, um, funds collaboratives of partners that are working together on climate action. And then we have this new program, the Tribal Capacity Building Program, um, which focuses really specifically on tribes. Um, and so in addition to those programs, we also have an arm of our work that focuses on building um, capacity also within state agencies to be offering really impactful technical assistance um, to folks working on the local level. Um, I won't talk about all of these things today, but definitely if folks do have questions about any of these, feel free to drop them in the chat or to connect with me directly. I'm happy to dive into really any of these um, that may be of interest. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and so I just mentioned Boost. Um, I know that we do have a lot of local government folks in the audience today. And so um, this is a program that may be of interest. We just wrap, wrapped up around two of the program and we'll probably be launching the second round later this year. Um, but it's a program that's really very much tailored to supporting local governments around you know, building the skills, relationships, and resources that they need in order to enact climate action. So we really work with each local government to develop a work plan um, that's tailored to their priorities and needs. We offer trainings, application assistance, planning and implementation assistance, and a number of other services, basically as needed um, to the participating local governments. So um, with that, I will go to the next slide and, and really focus in on RCC. But again, if there are questions about any of our other programs, happy to share more about those as well. Um, so the RCC program is really exciting and I wanna focus on it today also because we just launched the application cycle last week. Um, so really excited to start getting out the word about this program. Uh, RCC focuses on strengthening local coordination, leadership, knowledge, skills, and expertise to advance climate mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency projects. Um, by funding these coalitions of community serving partners in under resourced communities um, to do a number of different activities that are focused on capacity building. So aligning projects with funding opportunities, establishing partnerships on the local and regional level, achieving plan and policy readiness, and then creating a technical assistance network that can really help um, folks tap into different resources that are available on the regional and local level and help them better um, access and, and build competitiveness for um, different opportunities that are coming down from the state and federal level. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and so um, RCCs, um, you know, are really focusing, as I said, on helping folks compete for grants and implement projects. I think one thing that's really timely right now in particular um, around this program is that there are just so many resources that are coming down from the federal level. Angie, you know, talked about a few of them at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and we really see RCC as being a great way to help folks build, um, you know, the capacity, the projects, all of the different pieces that are needed to be able to really tap into some of those dollars. Um, we wanna make sure that you know, those dollars aren't going always to the same communities, but the communities that may not always have had a lot of opportunity to apply for competitive grant programs are able to put together those applications and be really you know, putting together strong proposals. So some of the eligible activities under this program include building relationships, identifying priorities, developing plans, policies, and projects, serving as a local technical assistance provider or hub. Um, we have also some pieces related to evaluation and peer learning. Um, and then we have some more optional activities that um, weren't necessarily directly in statute, but that we heard from folks through our public engagement were really important. And so we've added those as eligible activities as well, which include data collection analysis um, and then education and training. 
So we can go to the next slide. So the eligible applicants for the program include tribes, community-based organizations and nonprofits, local public agencies, small businesses, and then you know, other organizations with a history of providing community-based outreach and technical assistance. Um, all of those eligible applicants would need to come together to form a regional collaborative public stru partnership structure um, and would collectively submit one application based on their shared vision. Um, each collaborative needs to have at least one managing partner and, um, and three partners, um, but we don't have a cap on how many partners, so it could be much more than three as well. Uh, so um, with the application, applicants will collectively submit a draft partnership agreement that describes the governance and organization of this collaborative partnership structure. Um, and then through the implementation of the grant, we would finalize that, um, that partnership agreement and get it signed. So we can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of the project area requirements for the program, um, RCC includes requires applicants to put together a regional boundary that, that they decide on, um, which we have a pretty flexible definition around. Um, and for those of you who may have been tracking the program in round one, we actually made the um, project area requirements a little bit more flexible in terms of region. Um, so that is a difference from, from round one. Um, and so in this round, the definition is that you can base your region on shared natural, political, and built environment systems, climate risks, and other shared challenges or dynamics. Um, the region, you know, kind of our one requirement there is that the region must be contiguous and it also shouldn't be statewide. We're really wanting to see folks focus in on, um, you know, specific regions within the state of California. Um, we can go to the next slide here. <laughs> Excuse me. And so um, within that regional boundary, um, applicants will also select communities of focus where they'll be really focusing their place-based work. Um, and that's where we have this definition of under-resourced communities um, that's in statute for the program and that um, is, I think, a little bit specific to the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program. We did create a mapping tool in this round that I think is gonna be really helpful for folks um, when they're determining their eligibility for the program and then as they're putting together their application. Um, but just for everyone's knowledge um, around how that um, under-resourced community definition comes together, that includes disadvantaged communities according to Cal and Virus Green, low-income communities according to AB 1550, and then also um, disadvantaged communities according to the Department of Water Resources um, disadvantaged communities criteria as well. Um, and so in round two, again, for those of you who may have applied in round one, we did change up a little bit the requirements um, around communities of focus for round two. Um, so in this round, at least 75% of the census tracts or tribal areas that are identified within the communities of focus must be under-resourced. Um, and then the second way that folks can um, determine eligibility that's a little bit more relevant to tribes in particular um, is that you know, overall 70%, 75% of the communities of focus need to be under-resourced or um, tribal lands as long as 50% of the communities of focus meet our definition of under-resourced. Um, so essentially, you know, if a, um, a tribe is putting together an application and they, um, their tribal lands aren't designated as under-resourced within some of the different tools that are available at the state level, there would be a little bit of flexibility for them to um, include tribal lands that aren't represented in those tools. Um, they would just need to put together a justification um, in order for them to meet that 75% threshold. We will have more opportunities also during workshops to kind of talk through some of those pieces as well. Um, but this was a, a change that was really um, responsive to public comment that we received and, and we were really wanting to make sure uh, that the program is accessible both to federally and non-federally recognized tribes. So with that, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, for this upcoming round, we have $8.5 million that are available for round two awards. 
Um, we are doing funding tracks this year, so we'll have small grants between 500,000 and just shy of a million, um, and a large grant track between a million and 1.75 million. Um, this is the same range as round one, but we decided it made sense to kind of split it out because it was a pretty large range. Um, and we're hoping that this will also help with, um, you know, ensuring some diversity in terms of, of grant size um, across all of our grantees. We can go to the next slide now. This is our timeline. So we released the application last Thursday. Um, we will be starting to kick off our pre-proposal office hours tomorrow, actually, and those will be um, happening every Wednesday throughout um, the entire pre-proposal process. Um, we also have those applications that are happening in mid-July. Um, we have our first one is actually starting on Thursday as well. So folks should definitely sign up for that if you're interested. Um, Pre-proposals are due September 6th. Full proposals are due December 6th. Um, we'll be doing finalist interviews in mid-January and then aiming to make awards in February of next year. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, and this is a little bit more detail in our workshops. The workshop that we're having on Thursday is more of a high level webinar. And so it's it's not actually included in here, but um, it is on July 13th and you can find information about it on our website. I'll also, I think actually Tila already shared that in, in the chat. So you can go there and register, um, but we'll be providing that kind of high level webinar. And then we're also doing these like more, um, audience specific workshops throughout July, which will be a great opportunity to ask questions and kind of learn more about the details of the program. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And I already touched on this a little bit, but essentially throughout the pre-proposal process, we'll be offering weekly office hours. We also have been offering consultation calls with the TA providers for folks who applied in round one. If you'd like to um, kind of get connected with them on um, getting ready for round two. Um, and then program staff are very open to providing any general support that would be helpful to folks. Um, once the pre-proposal process has been completed and pre-proposals are required in this round, um, folks can uh, essentially will use the pre-proposals to be able to hand folks off to technical assistance. And once you um, are plugged into uh, technical assistance with our TA providers, this is the list of services that we'll be offering, including mapping support, work plan and budget development, collaborative partnership structure development, et cetera. Um, so that's what we have in terms of TA that's available. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and so Angie had asked me if I could just share a little bit about you know, previous grantees. Um, and we've only had one round previously, but we um, are really excited about the six um, really great collaboratives that we were able to fund in round one. And I'll dive in on just a couple of examples here. Um, but definitely encourage folks to take a look on our website where we have some profiles on each one of them. Um, and yeah, they're really, really, really exciting efforts that are happening across the state. So we can go to the next slide here. Um, so I think I actually maybe saw someone from the Gateway Cities COG who uh, introduced themselves in the chat earlier, but um, the Gateway Cities COG is leading this, um, this collaborative effort as the managing partner. Um, they have a really strong history of working closely with local governments and community partners in the region, um, which is in Southeast Los Angeles County. Um, there's also a partnership here with the LA County Chief Sustainability Office. Um, and a number of nonprofits, including the Southeast LA Collaborative, which brings together like really a dozen organizations that are working um, very much, very closely with community um, kind of across that region. Um, 
the gateway cities also are, um, you know, an area that has really high Cal Enviro screen scores due to challenges that they face related to air quality, pollution, extreme heat, and then different socioeconomic factors as well. Um, and they are a collection of, of really pretty small contract cities um, that often have struggled to be able to have the capacity to put together grant applications, for example. And so um, the partners are planning to be able to focus on helping those cities do some really meaningful community engagement in identifying regional climate needs um, and then developing and implementing multiple climate action plans. Um, they'll also be working on establishing a bench of grant writers to train and assist the cities and community-based organization grant partners um, to kind of help them access grant funding. Um, and so this is a great example. I wanted to have two, one that was led by kind of a public entity, and then the second one, um, which we can actually go to the next slide now, um, is led by a nonprofit organization. So the Marin Climate Justice Collaborative is led by the Canal Alliance, which is a community-based organization that focuses on support to immigrant communities and environmental justice, and is partnered with a large group of community-based organizations, as well as the city of San Rafael and Marin County. Um, and the collaborative is seeking to reverse historic underinvestment in San Rafael's Canal District and unincorporated Marin City. Um, these two communities are among the most vulnerable to sea level rise in the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, in, in Marin County, as I think many of you know, um, you know, it is a rel quite a wealthy like county world um, across the county, but then in these cities, there definitely is a really strong need for building that capacity and bringing in funding. Um, so the collaborative will be focusing on trust building with the local government, community engagement and trainings, and then developing healthy community plans for each one of the communities to identify some of that needed investment. Um, and great, yeah, I see Eileen um, in the chat um, said she's excited to be working on RCC. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that's my presentation and I can drop also my contact information into the chat here. I think definitely open to any questions that folks have and also, um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me as well if you have additional questions that come to mind after, um, after our conversation today. Thanks. Thank you, Ina. That was a really good overview. Um, you know, I see, is it Aileen or Eileen from Gateway Cities Council or COG? If you want to say anything, we would love to hear from you, even if it's just a, hey, we're happy to be awarded, or if you have any tips for folks. Hi, yeah, this is Eileen Quinn from the Gateway Cities Council of Governments. Um, we just kind of started kicking off the activities for the RCC. And I would say at the moment, we're kind of just trying to establish the structure. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great program and we're super excited. We wanted to focus specifically on the most disadvantaged of our disadvantaged communities. So we're really excited to be able to kind of target uh, assistance to those neighborhoods. Um, thank you. Perfect. Well, nice to hear from you. And I'll just say, you know, on a totally different side of things, I'm one. Of, I am on the team that is helping to implement one of those six RCCs for tribes, um, that Southern California one. And I'm just mentioning it because it's already been extremely helpful as we're setting up to have a place um, for folks to uh, to. A funded place to actually be looking for the right opportunities for the 25 tribes that that, that RCC is going to serve. We're even using it on the EECBG opportunity that I talked about. Like you know, local governments have um, a long way to go to apply, but um, a tremendous, like a huge proportion of the tribes that are eligible have not um, claimed their formula grant either. So this gives us an opportunity to not just do the outreach, but potentially form the coalition application, like the team application. Um, so, you know, it's just an example on the tribal side, but everything we hear from our SEEK network, everything we heard at the forum, it's all these opportunities are great, but we can't access them. We don't have the capacity to go get them. 
This was Strategic Growth Council coming in to say, hey, we're going to get ahead of this and give you guys an opportunity to build the capacity to keep getting these dollars. So it's kind of like cart before the horse, um, you know, get your capacity in place so you can regularly be successful at getting awarded. Um, okay, so let me see. I see one question here in the chat. I want to encourage other folks to put more questions in the chat or just raise your hand if you'd like to say something. Alice is asking, um, Ina, can you tell us more about the TA for state agencies guidelines program? I think that was before you started talking to RCC. Yeah, yeah, happy to. So um, actually through the same legislation that created the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program, um, which is Senate Bill 1072, SGC was also called to create technical assistance guidelines for state agencies, really to kind of put together some best practices to help more state agencies put in place technical assistance, because I think um, you know, as we all know, communities really benefit a lot from receiving technical assistance and, and not all programs necessarily have um, TA for, you know, a variety of reasons. And, and there are lots of barriers in many cases for state agencies to put in place technical assistance. Um, and so we really wanted to offer something that would be helpful for state agencies um, as they are thinking through what their TA programs could look like. Um, we also, you know, work very closely with them to help help folks along also through the process if they're newer to offering TA. Um, and we're in the process of updating those initial guidelines that we posted in 2020. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, if there are any state agency folks or, you know, I think it is a really helpful resource also for folks who are receiving technical assistance or other folks who are offering TA, um, you know, just to kind of get a better understanding of, of how these things work from the state level. Um, it's, yeah, I think a, a great resource to access. I can drop um, the link in the chat if folks are interested. And again, we're planning on um, updating it um, later this summer and aiming to post the final version in August. So definitely, yeah. Keep um, keep an eye out for that if you are interested in that one. Great, I see another um, question here in the chat. This is from Kay McKean, and I think on the RCC, would regional projects focus on planning and deploying circular economy solutions be welcomed? Yeah, I mean, I think, there is a focus very much on climate for the program, but we focus on climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience and have a pretty broad definition of what that could be. So, you know, I think um, <clears throat> it would be important to really, in, in a proposal for RCC, make really strong connections to climate and really explain how some of those pieces connect to, um, you know, any really of those climate strategies. Um, but yeah, I think certainly those pieces would um, would be eligible for the program. One thing that I will say is I think, um, you know, the, the enabling legislation for the program is very much focused also on kind of bringing together diverse partners who are working on different aspects of climate as well and really kind of bringing together folks who might be working on energy and transportation and housing and um, you know, waste um, diversion and things like that. And so um, really thinking about kind of opportunities to broaden the tent and, and make sure that there is, you know, a lot of coordination and collaboration happening between folks who are working on different types of climate solutions is really kind of central to RCC. <clears throat> and so I definitely encourage anyone who's thinking of applying to um, you know, consider if there are other partners who might be working on other types of climate-related work that um, that might make sense to partner with um, as well. Yeah, I hope folks are hearing like how nice it is to see a program that's sort of an all-climate program that's not cutting things up too small. It really is helpful uh, when it comes to implementation to not have to slice and dice. Um, you know, can I stay on that topic for just a second, um, which is like a lot of folks when I talk to communities and they're interested in a program, they kind of want to screen their ideas before they dive too far in. And I know you have TA. Is that 
an opportunity? Like, can a community come to you or your team and say, hey, like, is this eligible? Kind of like Kay McKean just did. Yeah. Yeah. So we have technical assistance that, um, <clears throat> that we're offering. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Um, we have technical assistance that we're offering throughout the pre-proposal process um, through office hours that we're holding every Wednesday. So folks can feel free to drop in on those at any time and run ideas by um, the program staff, as well as our technical assistance providers will be joining that as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also open to folks reaching out to us directly and you know asking specific questions. Um, and for folks who applied in round one, there's an opportunity also to, um, to have a consultation call with our technical assistance providers um, to kind of get pieces together and in, in getting ready for round two. Um, <clears throat> and then we will be offering technical assistance for the full proposal where there will be kind of a third party technical assistance provider who will really work um, much more one-on-one -on -one with applicants to kind of help them um, get their application ready to go. So cool. And you know, that must feel very different to a lot of you out there because it felt different to me to know that there isn't this like wall of silence that's usually up during a solicitation where you can't, you know, ask questions. Here you really can. Um, so Stacy from SB Cogs adds a question. As a fellow council of governments, how can we best support our member cities? Do you have any suggestions? Are we eligible to apply or could we best support as being part of the collaborative? So this is from a cog. Yeah, great, great question. Um, definitely eligible to apply as a managing partner if you would like, um, but you could also be um, either, you know, a direct partner or we have also in this round opportunity to have supporters who may not be funded members of the collaborative, but are supporting in some way through in-kind um, <clears throat> engagement. So I think it would really depend on, you know what you think makes the most sense for the partners that you would be bringing into the collaborative and and I'm working with them to figure out you know who has the capacity to be the managing partner the managing partner does require um you know being the one who enters the grant agreement with the strategic growth council and then um kind of managing all of the invoicing we do also offer advanced pay through this program and so that's another piece that the managing partner if there are partners who would like to do advanced pay we'll need to kind of like coordinate and collaborate on um so yeah it really depends we have had um two actually grantees that have COGS that were the managing partner, um, but then we have a number where of applications that came forward where, um, you know, public entities were uh, more of a partner or kind of more in a support role where they were engaged but not necessarily receiving grant funds through the program. So a lot of different options, really. I think it, it's, we're really trying to make sure that it's tailored to you know, all of the different regions across the state and recognize that there's obviously a lot of variation in terms of what will make the most sense for, for each region. Thank you. And thanks to Aileen again for chiming in there to talk about her experience as a CBO, bridging the gap between cities and community members. So thank you for that. And then there is this other question in terms of eligibility and roles about private sector, just, you know, just generally, how do private sector companies, how can they, how should they be involved in this? Yeah, really great question. So um, small businesses are eligible for the program. And so we do have a definition of um, small business in the guidelines, which you can look at and see if uh, you would be eligible for. Um, but then I think, you know, for non-small business um you know, for-profit companies. I think there are opportunities to be us in more of a supporting role. Um, I think it would really kind of depend on, on what makes the most sense. Um, one thing also to note is that, um, you know, consultants can definitely be playing a role in some of the work that happens as a part of the collaborative. And so they can either be a collaborative partner or um, there can be like a set aside within the budget for a certain amount that might uh, be needed to bring on, you know, some specific um, support from a contractor. So I think 
there could be, you know, a number of different ways that nonprofits or sorry, for-profit organizations could be um, engaged in, uh, in RCC. And again, I think it'll really depend on kind of engaging very much with some of the partners that, um, that you think would make sense to work with on an RCC and figuring out what that role should be. Thanks, Ina. Uh, let's see, I don't see the other hand, hands up. I do see a comment here um, about what programs are needed that focus on rural communities. It's not equitable to have rural communities compete against massive urban cities with teams of consultants. I hear you. You know what? That sounds like a really good thing to talk about if you want to stick around in the breakout, the bonus breakout at noon. There are some programs. There's quite a few that I'm seeing that are really focused on rural areas. And let's talk about it. Uh, so stick around. Yeah. And um, I can also just say on that piece as well, we definitely do want to have rural communities come forward for RCC. Um, and are very much, you know, taking into consideration capacity level in, in reviewing applications. So part of the scoring for this um, application includes, you know, a, a section on project need. And so we'd really encourage rural communities that are applying to, you know, really explain in, in those project need sections, what are some of those capacity challenges that may be specific to being a rural community um, you know, that, that the RCC program could really help with. Um, but yeah, it's a really great point and definitely something that we're, we're thinking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like there's more interest in the chat about a conversation about rural needs. So let's do it. Um, stick around at noon. Aaron is asking another question. Are there separate deliverables for the small and large grants? I'm skimming guidelines and it looks like they are the same. Yeah, they are the same. No separate deliverables. Um, but basically, I think we realized in round one, we had a really large um, range. Uh, it was from 500,000 to 1.75 million, which was what we heard from folks made the most sense in terms of the range. But we realized that it would make sense to split it out into two um, separate tracks so that you know folks who had that larger budget would be competing against each other and folks who had a smaller budget would be competing against each other so it really you know it means that the work plan that you would create would be you know scaled to the size of the budget that you're asking for um but it's not it's not a situation in which there would be like different deliverables for one or the other um, the deliverables for the program are very much um, kind of tailored to capacity building within the region that you're focused on. Um, and so, yeah, we'll dive in more in the details on that on um, in our workshop as well. And if anyone has like more questions about deliverables, I can dive into that um, through either email or, or in another forum. But yeah, um, they're very, very similar, just different um different budget amounts great okay um you know my just maybe one last question just what do you see about do you see this being a recurring program so we're seeing two rounds do you foresee this being like an annual thing are we waiting to hear more from budget what's what's the future look like and and with that if you get one chunk can you expect to get another round of funds Great question. Um, currently, we have funding for two rounds. Um, we don't have a continuous appropriation for this program. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily know for sure. We are hoping that there will be continued rounds of the program, um, but we'll have to see kind of what happens with the budget. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, there isn't necessarily any guarantee that folks would have you know, multiple rounds of funding um, after that that first um, grant for those who have received grants or, or who will in round two. Um, but I think a lot of the work that we're doing with the collaboratives is very much, you know, trying to support long-term sustainability of this work. And so hoping that through the work that's happening through the RCC, um, you know, folks will be accessing grant dollars and staffing up and kind of building this network of partners who can be working on this over a longer period of time. Um, and then, yeah, also hoping that, um, you know, we'll have 
further rounds of the program in the future that we'll be able to make available. But yeah, that'll that's a little bit out of our hands and, and more in the budget process where that'll be decided. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes a group like us can be helpful, you know, encourage like saying how wonderful something is, encouraging the legislature at some points to consider another appropriation. So, um, and we've seen this with Strategic Growth Council a lot that sometimes your programs start off as maybe one time or two time things and then they get continued. So let's hope, but either way, I'd be hearing that as a potential recipient as, this is seed money to get the capacity to get the money and continue to revolve it into this thing so it, so it lasts. Um, okay, so you know there might be more questions for you in the chat. I'm going to move us into our last little segment here. Ina, thank you very much for that. That was super helpful. Um, we hope you all are inspired out there to um, to go for this program. I you know this might be the kind of thing that comes around not so often and it's I really think these RCCs are gonna be something that that lasts like these regional structures get in on, on the ground floor I think it's an important moment um all right thanks again Ina so yeah Kelsey I wonder if Kelsey's around um she, Kelsey is our fearless organizer of the SEEK forum so thanks again Kelsey for putting on a great forum and I wanted her to just talk about some of the re where you can find some of the SEEK forum resources yeah, sure. Thanks, Angie. Um, well, as you all know, last month was the the 2023 forum, which was really successful. We had about 400 people arrive at the event. Um, and we have all of our um, the PowerPoints that were done during during the event on our website. Um, you can um, see like and add the link into the chat. Um, we also have just closed our um, forum survey. Um, so if anybody took that survey, thank you very much. Um, we'll be taking a look at the results and hopefully getting some good, you know, uh, feedback and advice for next year. Um, and we'll also be starting, you know, thinking about what we're doing next year pretty soon here. So, you know, really excited to to continue the work. Thanks, Kelsey. Give her an emoji. She's just recovered from that forum. <laughs> Um, and then I have this last little bit here, you know, I play lots of roles with SEEK and one of them is to provide TA and what I'm hearing from a lot of you is sort of looking for a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a diagnosis in terms of, hey, I have this need, do you know any funding opportunities that are applicable? That's kind of the kind of level that I can maybe point you in the right direction of some grants. So um, you can contact me anytime. I can't write a grant for you, but I can help point you in the right direction and maybe do some work. Um, some skimming, um, some review of some opportunities with you. Uh, so there's my email address. Maybe Tila can drop that in the chat as well. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so we're back to monthly. Again, we missed you last month, but we um, are always back. If you have ideas for things that you would like to hear about, at a learn, please send them our way. Um, next month, the goal is, because we heard from you in our, our learn survey, that you really want to dive in on more um, grant getting advice. And so that's the goal for next month is to bring in an, a grant expert and do a little bit more, um, sort of more of like a training um, alongside of our opportunity round table. As always, we'd love for you to share this invitation with others that you're aware of that could benefit from getting this heads up on all of these opportunities. Um, we are very fortunate to have this participation be really good and we just want it to grow. Um, and with that, that's our that's our learn for the day.